Good evening, good evening. This is Lynette, and this is the 21st Century Watchman's Channel. And it's about time. We're now in the book of Galatians, chapters 4 through 6, Acts 17, and Acts 18, verses 1 through 17. Let's get started, shall we? Got a lot to cover. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is the under the guardians and managers until the date set by his father. Now, this seems to be like, what's going on? Where are we talking about? This is an argument that he is giving to the Galatians because he sees they've kind of gone astray. And he's on his, as I mentioned earlier, on his second uh, missionary journey. And he's giving his dispensational ar argument. A dispensation means, or dispensationalism is a theological uh, f uh, framework of interpreting the Bible, which um, maintains that history is divided into ages or seasons or times um, or dispensations, if we will. So history is divided into ages, and so he's this is the age of the child versus the slave. He's talking about that. So we're we're gonna sort of compare those things so you can see where he's coming from. I hope it makes sense to you. So it says, in the same way, verses 3, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. So, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of, wim of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Now see, back in just like in Jewish times. Now, Paul's talking to Galatians who were uh, from the uh, Roman Empire Greeks. He's talking to them. And in their culture, they have a coming of age, just like Jews have with bar mitzvahs or bat mitzvahs for girls. They have bar mitzvahs, and, and the uh, Greeks had something similar, where even though they had sons or they had, they, they had to go through a certain time period and then a ritual of sorts uh, of teaching a coming of age ceremony by which they um, uh, become men. And then from that point, they were considered heirs. So you could be a son and you had an inheritance, but you weren't an heir. You A son was treated, treated just like a slave. You had a lot to learn. You were not, uh, you didn't have any uh, substance, even though you had the promise of something you still didn't have it in actuality and air at that particular point was treated differently and this is what the difference is here and he's letting them know we were you know we were also children we were enslaved to the principles of the world and that means in in our mindsets we didn't know what we're supposed to be doing we didn't know how to act before but now the fullness of time has come god sent forth his son you know but they didn't know the jews didn't know and not and neither did they know They've been doing things all willy-nilly, all immature-like. And now that the fullness of time is coming, Jesus has come into this world, born of a woman better known as Mary, born under the law. He was born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption or that the, that the others that were not were, we might receive adoption as sons. That's how it was called during that time. Adoption is not the way it was back in the time. But like I said, they had to go through a certain ceremony in order for them to become uh, heirs. And that's what he's saying. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. So the Holy Spirit is living within us, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So we went from slaves to heirs. That's what he's telling them. They are heirs now. They are no longer slaves and they shouldn't be slipping. And they should feel uh, a different kind of, of um, prominence and, and ownership of what of the gospel, because you know I I own this. this is, it's, I'm part of this. I'm this is my inheritance as well. It doesn't just belong to a group. It belongs to me too. Verse eight. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God. The, our, the, our former life, our, our indoctrination into the, the sin of this world, those, those sinners and the, and the people that taught us to sin were not gods. 
God is God. And we've been, and now we've been formally, we're, we're formalized heirs. We're with the real God, a God. The, what we've been dealing with before was, was, was God like, I guess, but what we're talking about for real is the for real show enough down in the dirt, God. We have an up in the heavens, God. And the of the earth is the fullness thereof, God. That's that's who we are serving now. But it says, but now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, we don't just know God, but to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? Whose slaves you want to be once more? So how, how do you go back? So they were they started doing things that were that enslaved them, like in the law. They had allowed someone to slip in and give them a new gospel. This is what happened. You know, you have to do this in order for you to be saved. Now they'd already been told that all they had to do was believe and to change their ways from this and allow the Holy Spirit to come in and to refine them with the refiner's fire and to change their ways. He didn't say to do the things that were under the law in order for them to be um, saved or in order for them to have the inheritance that, you know, is due us at this particular point for them to be heirs. They have gotten enslaved and they're started doing other things. And they are, and the law, as we know, was impossible for the, for the Jews to keep. So how was it going to be possible for these new converts to keep this law? It was not going to be that. And there were some people that tried to mix their stuff in when they're telling us what to do. And we have to be able to be readers and interpreters of the word ourselves, and not just let someone just give it to us. But they didn't have a lot of choices during that time. But So they had to, to be discerners and use the gifts God gave them and the Holy Spirit gave them, excuse me. And that's what Paul is admonishing them for. You've got to get it together. You've got to use your discernment. You should know. What's the point? So he says, you observe days and months and seasons and years. This is verse 10. So you you going back to the feast of this and the feast of that. And you want to probably sacrifice some stuff. The the price has already been paid. What are you going back for when the, the when the gospel moves us forward? When Jesus tore the veil, his death took care of all of that. We have there's no separation. And you and we have the Holy Spirit dwelling. Within us, we are the temples. We're, we don't have to carry one around. We are the temples. What are you doing? You house the Holy Ghost. What's going on? So he says, I'm afraid I may have labored over you in vain. I, I'm afraid I might have wasted my time. I'm afraid I did all of this for nothing. Because you're going backwards and I taught you forward. How did you even get to know that stuff? Because I didn't teach it to you. Okay, though. Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. So here he here he, he goes. He's telling them. So he's he he went from you know telling them what you shouldn't be doing because of what God what Christ has done to us. Now he's saying he says you did me no wrong, and now he's becoming sentimental. He's trying to be personal with them. So he's giving them a personal argument. So he went from the dispensational, talking about how God changed us from the ages and how we went from, from the law, dispensation of law to dispensation of grace. And, you know, and how we're, how we don't have to, to be under bondage and we're now free through Christ. And now he's on to, you know, you did me no wrong. I, you, you know me. You did me no wrong. He says, you know, it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. I was here, I was suffering. You know, you know me. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. You received me even though I was going through some stuff. You listened to what I had to say. You know me. I was here when when I was alienating. You were there for me. And what what happened? It says, what then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. That's how generous you guys were to me. You would have gouged out your own eyes. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you, but for no good purpose. You know, they're they talking about you in a good way too, but, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. 
They want to cut you off from the blessings so that you can make them look like they're big and bad. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose. And not only when I am present with you, my little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I'm I'm still trying to birth you out and make you the people you're supposed to be. I, I'm laboring here. I'm back where we started. Bruh. I wish I could present you or present with, or, you know, I could be present, excuse me, be present with you now and change my tone. For I am perplexed about you. I'm puzzled. I'm trying to figure out what's up. That's what Paul's saying. Tell me. So here we go again. He's moved. He's moving into the, he's an allegory. You can tell he's moving into that situation. Tell me who you desire to be under the law. Do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. By the son of the slave was born according to the flesh. He was doing what he wasn't supposed to be doing. He wasn't doing what the, what the Lord told him to do. The Lord had already told him prior that he's going to get a wife through his son, Sarah. But he decided to do something else. So this, is a, this is by um, Sarah's, or Sarah's um, encouragement. And so it became a son of the flesh. But here we go. Now, this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. Oh, wow. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. That's Sarah. She is our mother. Because remember, we became, you know, we're the seed of Abraham. So we're with that, and this, and they don't count. And, and in God's kingdom, what's going on with um, Ishmael? It's not the same thing that's going on through um, his son Isaac. And that's who um, Sarah had. For it is written, rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. Children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son. For the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free. He gave an allegory. He gave an analogy. He let, this is not what's, we are not those people. This is not that. We are, we are children of the free woman. Stop going back to slavery. That's what he's saying. Galatians 5. For freedom, Christ has set us free. For freedom. He wants us to be free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Here we are now. He's talking to them about what's, about what's what here now. Liberty, not bondage. Look, I look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. If you're concerned about being circumcised, you have to go back to that because you don't have to do that. That might be a health thing now, but we don't have to go. That's not a spiritual thing for us. Circumcision, because God, Jesus circumcised the heart and the Holy Spirit's living within us. We don't have to do that physically in order to be saved. That's what he's saying. He says, I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. Not part, you can't pick and choose. You can't pick and choose, no. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. We wait for the hope of righteousness. We wait. For in Christ, Jesus neither circum circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. For, for in Christ Jesus, circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith worketh through love. Faith. Faith. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. We have to have faith. Even our boy Abraham. Gentile before he became circumcised, before he became the father of you know of the Israelites, or, you know the, the one of the forefathers anyway. He was a Gentile, and he but 
His faith was counted unto him righteousness. His faith. Because he moved when God said move. I'm just saying. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This is persuasion. Oh, this persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little leaven. It don't take but a little bit and mess it all up. Or, or rise it all up. Raise it all up. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view. And the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty. Whoever's messing you, whoever's, whoever's trying to start some stuff, is going to get dealt with. Whoever he is. But if I, brother, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? If I'm preaching it, why am I still being persecuted? Because they, they want that. They want that. Why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. I wish they just cut it off. Stop. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Don't mean you can do everything. Don't mean you're supposed to be submitting to everything because you're free. You're, you're, you're free from the law, but you still are submitted to Christ. And so a freedom in love, freedom in and not being in, in that kind of, of the, you know, bondage. But you have to understand there are some rules now. Let's, let's stop playing. But it says, but through love, serve one another. But through love, serve one We should all be thinking about how we can serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your brother as yourself. That's the whole law is fulfilled that way. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. That's facts. But I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. When we, you know, here's some things here. Idolatry. This is the flesh. These are flesh things. Flesh means your flesh means your will. Idolatry, rebelliousness, selfishness, worldly attitudes, lust, adultery, bondage, all that's flesh. That's your will. But spirit, that's God's will. Love, long suffering, servant attitude, right? Mindset, joy, freedom, faith. You don't feel bound when you loving the Lord and you doing what he wants you to do. You don't feel bound. You feel free. That's what he's saying. So it says, um, I'll go back to 17. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For, though, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, straight up. Impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery. Enmity, you got problems with people. You, you, you know, you beefing out here in these streets. I ain't saying Kendrick and Drake, but I'm saying we beefing. I'm always something. Oh, since she did, she said. He said he did. He's trying to keep me from that promotion. Uh, he's trying to keep me from doing this, that, and the other. Got his foot on my neck. I don't like him. I don't like her. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger. You no control. Rivalries dissensions, divisions, that's works of the flesh right there. And they're evident, they're quick, and they're, and they're clear to see. Um, it also says envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. It ain't, it wasn't even, the list wasn't even exhausted. It was just, this, this is just a sampling. This is just a, a you know, a little list. This is some more stuff all up in there for sorcery and, and, and you know, and divisions and drunkenness. No, uh-uh. We don't want none of that. So I, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We got to watch this mess. Let's get out of this. We should be past this. But we're not a lot of us. Some of us are still slipping. Some of us are still young in the faith. But we have to get past this. We have to let the Holy Spirit have his way. Obedience is better than sacrifice. We've got, just got to be obedient. Let's just do what the, the Lord says. You Don't do this. Don't know sexual immorality. No, That means no adultery. That means no fornication, no bestiality, no porn, because it, it, it leads to a mindset, real talk. No impurity. Keep your mouth clean. Stop cussing. I'm just saying. Stop talking about people. You even got to use curse words, but don't talk about people. No sensuality. Stop. We ain't got to dress all sexy. Well, I mean, you, you're, 
it, it's not necessary. It's just not necessary. We, ain't got, we don't have to look a certain way. No idolatry. A lot of things you you have no money idols. No, no, I got my no horoscopes, none of that stuff. No sorcery, no casting, no spells, all of that. Be mindful. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Love. God is love. The spirit of, is love. God. We we're showing caring and 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 um and uh and consideration toward one another that's love thinking about others before ourselves that's love being willing to give our lives for the other that's love putting god above everything else that's love joy that's not happiness joy is remembering what god did for you and what he's going to do for you and what he and who and who he is and who he has been to you in, in when you're even in um predicaments that are not favorable Remember that the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is your strength. That joy, being able to smile when everybody else is, even though I hurt, though I smile, Kurt Franklin's song. I, I smile, I, joy, peace. That peace that passes all understanding. When you're feeling good and not in turmoil, even when there's a storm all around you, you know God's got you. That's peace, patience. You learn how to wait on the Lord. You waiting in him. You hiding in the shelter of the most high under his wings. You're there. You're That's patience. I've got to wait on him. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount upon wings as eagles. They shall walk and not be weary. They shall run and not faint. That is a patience work, doing that. Kindness. Uh, doing things uh, just because and not, be, not to look for, um, for others. Uh, uh, you know, for just because. Giving to the poor. Taking care of the of the the widows and the orphans, goodness, helping people just because, loving God and 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 acts of of uh, pure pure love, just doing the will of God, just doing goodness, kindnesses, doing things for others, goodnesses. I'm 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 trying to do the I'm trying to do things necessarily for myself and for, for my family, but but the good things that are that are things that God would love. You know that's kind of goodness, faithfulness. I can you can be counted on. Gentleness. You're not trying to be all, you know, riotous and have an attitude. Learn how to calm down. Self control. Being able to work, not let your emotions rule you. Those things. That that's what. There's nothing. No law against that. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. There and. And Paul says later on that we die, he dies daily to the flesh because it's, it's it's a it's a process, baby. It, it is not something that happens instantaneously. It it's a process. We it, we got to keep walking in this thing. That's how it goes. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Keeping in step, keeping in step. We're following Him. He's walking in front of us. He's leading us. Are we trying to drag Him? We need to keep in step. Keep up, baby. Keep up. Keep up. Let us not become conceited. <laughs> Don't get cocky up in here. Provoking one another. Envying one another. Let's not be conceited. Provoking one another. Envying one another. Let's not be any of those things. Because when you're conceited, you provoke people. And, and, and let's not envy anybody. Let's just run our own race. These are just my thoughts. Galatians 6. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in, spirit, in, the, in a spirit of gentleness. Bottom line. Well, let's let's be quick to restore. If anyone is this is this is straight up. This is this is God's glory, not not for yourself. This is God's glory, not for yourself. I'm just saying. Others not self. We're still doing that. We're still in, still doing this. We we learn how to live by the spirit, not the flesh. On in chapters five. Now we're others, not ourselves. Again, brothers, if anyone is called in the in transgression, you are you who are spiritual should restore him in spirit of in the spirit of gentleness. In the spirit of gentleness, yes. Bear, it says, keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. You know, don't, so don't, let's restore because you, and watch yourself because you might be tempted just like this person was. So let's not. Bear one another's burden, so fulfill the law of Christ. That's what, that's what 
Christ said. He bared our burdens on the cross and took them all the way up there and died. We should bear one another's burden. We should take them to the Lord in prayer. For his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I'm just saying. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. We're not such a much. We're not such a much. We're not such a much. Don't, don't think you're better than your brother because he's slipping or he has a transgression. He, you just have something else. We all have something. He may not know yours, but but you but you got something. Everybody has something. I mean, we, they may not be evident, but because we have nobody, the Bible says even at our best, we're less than a filthy bag. That's the word. We have something, and we're all working out our, our our salvation daily. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone, and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. We got to deal with our own stuff. So let us not judge anybody. Let us take, be spiritual and restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Let's not be harsh. You shouldn't have done, you, you know. Pray him through. Pray him through. Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Share all good things with the one who teaches. Anybody that's teaching the word, the one who has taught the word should be, should be sharing good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Watch out. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. We want eternal life. Let's raise our hands. We want that. Let on be in that line. I'm going to be in the eternal life line. I don't want to be in the corruption line. Not for me. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season, he will, we will reap. Don't grow weary. This is due season. This is due season. Due season. If we do not give up. If we do not give up. If we do not give up. I've been in, I, I was in warfare for a while. For a while. For a while. Um, I was safe 14 years. And look, and God has, has changed things. Uh for 14 years and God has changed things. He is, uh, it doesn't always happen when you want it to happen. It doesn't, it doesn't come like that, but God will turn it around. He turned it around for me. He'll turn it around for you too. I'm just saying. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. Let's do good to everyone. Not to some people. You know what it didn't say? Some people. It didn't say to who we want to. It said to everyone. I have been doing things for people that don't like me. That is a rewarding thing. I didn't know how rewarding it was. Because it looks, can I say, and it may sound selfish and like I'm just, you know, petty. Because I'm not trying to be that. But I just decided I was going to do something good for people that didn't like me. And to see the bafflement on their face. Because they know that they did you wrong. And they're wondering, what's, what's good? What's wrong with her? Because I'm about that goodness life. I'm about doing what God says. And it gives you a peace. And you know, and you know they, 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 they have to go back and discuss it. Or, and they're they concerned. And, and they, they want to do something to reciprocate because they don't want you to have one up on them. And it just gives you the favor of men, too. And, and other people see you doing good no matter what's going on with you. And it just changes people's perspectives. God has a way. This is, this is a process. God knows and the Holy Spirit's got some, some teaching for us to, to learn. Let us be submitted to that process. How about that? And it says, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Let We should do also even more to those who are of the household of the faith. How about that? All right. See with what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised. So we're not trying to do that. And only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law. But they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. So they can talk about it. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Wow, right? For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them, and upon the Israel of God. 
of the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. We're not concerned about circumcision. We're only concerned about Jesus and what he did on the cross, that work. We're not concerned about anything that's going to bind us. We want, don't want to be bound anymore. We have, there's freedom in Christ. And we're only concerned about God's glory, not our own. Let's do the will of the Spirit, which is the will of God. Acts 17. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis, or yes, and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom. He first thing he did was he hit the he was hitting the, the synagogue so he could go in and talk to the and Jesus said the same thing. He went to the synagogues too. Let's see what's up. Let's discuss some things. Let me disrupt some stuff. Let me change your thinking. Let me see what y'all on. What they on? Let me see what they on. And Paul went in, as it was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scripture. So he stayed at least three weeks, right? Explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ, for the Christ, the Messiah, to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. So they were persuaded in a, a few of the, uh, uh, many of the great the devout Greeks and a lot of women, a lot of women. It's okay. The people get all discombobulated because there's so many women as opposed to men in church. Well, it was that same thing over here um, in Thessalonica. Come on, don't come for us. But the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men of the, that, of that, of the rabble, they formed a mob. All right set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, so remind you of when they went to um, Abraham's nephew's house, Lot's house in Gamara, right? Coming to bring people out. They weren't, they, but this was jealousy this time. This wasn't lust. This was jealousy. You know, God didn't like jealousy. He had to tell us in a previous chapter not to, not to, um, Deal with the lust of the flesh. This is the lust of the flesh, jealousy. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. That means they, that gospel has turned the world upside down and Jason has received them. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar saying that there is another king, Jesus. So they hit him where they, you know, be, so not just not talking about his good work, I'm talking, not talking about the signs and wonders and miracles that follows, not talking about the healing that follows, not talking about the good works they did, but hitting them where they where they had a problem. They didn't you can't have another king other than Caesar. And now we got King Jesus. Now we're gonna put that out there. And when you put that out there, then it becomes a problem for the people here. That's what's up right here. So he says, and the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Let me find you. Let me find you. And, you know, we're going to give you a little bail money and we're gonna, then we're going to let you go. For, for, because I'm, I'm hearing these allegations and I don't like them. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more, no, more noble than those in Thessalonica. These Jews were more noble. The ones in Berea. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scripture daily to see if these things were, were so. They were checking to see if things were true. Many of them therefore believed with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. Not with a few. Not with, there's this, so it was a whole more, a lot of women ready to, to, to jump on in that were studying too. It's okay for women to study. Let's study. But when the, the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. They just wouldn't let the people alone. They just won't let Paul alone. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul 
brought him as far as Athens. And after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. Now, while Paul was, was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. Oh, we're not, we're not supposed to feel comfortable around idols. We're not. I'm not saying we're supposed to speak out against them every time we see them, but we shouldn't feel the comfort. This is exactly what he's showing us. So, we, so we, if we're comfortable in the midst of all, all kinds of lascivious acts and, and foolishness and whatnot, and they drinking and, and smoking all kinds of stuff, and we're real comfortable. And I mean, I'm just saying cursing everybody out, and we don't feel, you know, a little uncomfortable. I'm not saying that we have to stop the music, but we should feel this shouldn't be a, a, the place where we want to dwell. This, this should not be our, our resting place. Now, Jesus went and, and he hung out with the wine bibber because he was Jesus. And, you know, and we, he didn't look down on anybody. But he would, I mean, but he had his crew that he hung with. You just can't grow in that environment. We're trying to grow. And unless, you, and if you, if you used to be a, a drug um, user, the, the last thing you should be going to is a crack house. I'm just saying, so we have to, to know when and where. And we got to learn some temperance, but we shouldn't be hanging out. His spirit was, his spirit was, was troubled. We need to be, um, uh, be troubled a little bit too. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. He still was talking to everybody, he didn't care. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign div or divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the um, Areopagus saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. All right. They wanted the tea. They wanted the new tea. What's the new tea? They were, This was the, um, the internet of their time. They were, you know, trying to get it all. And this was, I, I don't know, this wasn't the shade room, but it, it was... Uh, um, the place where this is their TMZ. They, what, what's the new stuff? We want to know what that is. Put us on. So Paul standing in the midst of the Areopagus said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For, I, for as I pass along and observe the objects of, our, of, um, objects of your worship, I all found also an altar to, with the, this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. So he, they knew there was some God that they didn't know. And so he decided to, to minister where they were. He used something that they used in order for it to be a, um, a help to them and in order for them to be able to relate. He, gave, he found a metaphor or something they could use as a metaphor in their own thing, in their own um, culture. Um, and there's a book called The Peace Child where these uh, missionaries went into this uh this uh, rural, uh, 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 I'll say, uh, not not just rural, but uh, indigenous group, that tribal community, where they offered a peace child uh, as a sacrifice when they were having wars with people. And he used this as an analogy to spread the gospel about Jesus being the peace child, and they were able to understand it. And this is what's going on here. He's able to show them that the unknown God, that that our God is the unknown God. Look at Paul. You gotta be, you gotta be on your feet. Gotta, gotta be thinking on your feet all the time. Then the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human gods as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind, mankind life and breath and everything. He don't need none of them from us. He don't need none of that. And he made from one man every nation of, man, of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, 
We ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silk or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all raising him from the dead. All right. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, the um, Arapagot, the Arapagot, Gite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with him. All right there. He was getting some followers, even in this, even in this. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, received come from Italy. Oh, sorry, recently come from Italy with wife, his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. So it was a problem. They had to go. The Emperor Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome as a result of ongoing unrest in the Jewish communities and political unrest caused by the Jewish community advocating for increased rights. And you can find this at in homeworkstudy.com. Right, this, uh, this is why he, the Emperor Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome because they were having unrest. There was always some, some problems over there and he, they were tired of it. So he expelled them all from me. You got to get out of here. Y'all doing, y'all, y'all being too messy. It's always a problem. Um, can I use the words encampments? They don't even want no problems. Like they have on the college campus right now. They don't want no, I, what we not going to have in, over in this town. We're not doing that foolishness. We're not doing that. Y'all take that somewhere else. It says, uh, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome and he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked. For they were tent makers by trade. Paul was a tent maker. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. Yeah, he did. Paul was doing his thing, wasn't it? Gotta love him. Um, I want to change it. There we go. My God. It's always something, isn't it? There we go. Gotta get you back here so I can see. Excuse me. When Silas and Timothy arrived in Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that, that Christ was Jesus, that the Messiah was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he sh shook out his garments and said to them, your blood, because remember he said, check off the dust, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. I ain't going to bother with y'all no more. I'm I'm going to go to the Gentiles. They, they're ready to hear it. I'm wasting my time talking to you. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Tite, a tidy as justice, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. Everybody's not your audience. Everybody's not your audience. You may be for some people and, not, and you may not be for others. He, he couldn't talk to his own. They, they knew too much about him. Sometimes it's, they're just too hard headed, bottom line. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent for I am with you. So don't, don't get, don't get caught up in what they're, what they're doing. Don't be silent. Keep on talking for I'm with you and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. I have many in this city. You never know who God has in this city. You never knew how many God has on your job. You never know. Keep on talking. He'll tell you. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. He went from those three, those three Sabbaths to a year and a, <laughs> a year and six months. But when Gal, uh, Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. Now, what do they care? But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gal Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O oh Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. This ain't nothing to do with us. This ain't nothing to do with us. This is y'all's law. This ain't, this ain't Caesar's law. But since it's a matter of questioning about words and names of your own law, see it to yourselves. See to it yourselves. This ain't got nothing to do with me. I refuse to be a judge of these things. I'm not getting involved. 
This is Pontius Pilate. What are you doing? And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. They got on Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him. Lord, having said that, you just never know what you're going to when the persecution is going to come. You got to be ready. You got to be willing. And and people will bring will try to trump up charges on you. You have to be prepared for the prosecute the persecution. We have um, been living in a time where there's not been a lot of persecution in this country in the West for your for your religious choices and for um, your your choices of faith. There will come a time when that changes, or will we be ready? Are we so grounded in the word that we um, will be ready for persecution? Let us see. I hope that we are. I pray that you are prepared. And I pray that if you are not prepared at this time, that you will be, will be prepared in the times to come. And I pray that you are studying to show yourself approved. And if you have not done that, um, if you are struggling and you are still uh, not made a decision for Christ, I pray that you that you make one today. And that you, if you have, repent. If you've not done all that you were supposed to, if you've fallen into a, a lust of the flesh and you're still fighting and struggling like all of us are. Repent and let us keep it pushing. Either get saved right now and join the team or, or repent and let's keep it pushing. Because Jesus is ready to take us on. The Holy Spirit's going to lead us. Um, Jesus' his blood saves anyway and the Holy Spirit's going to take us through. How about that? Repeat after me. Father, it is written in your word that if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that you have raised him from the dead, I shall be saved. Therefore, Father, I confess that Jesus is my Lord. I make him Lord of my life right now. I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. I renounce my past life with Satan and close the door to any of his devices. I thank you for forgiving me of all my sin. Jesus is my Lord and I am a new creation. Old things have passed away and now all things become new. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you've said this prayer with me and you are, you know, it's your first time and you, you're, you decided to rededicate or you are saved, for the first time, we rejoice with you. Put your name in the chat so that we can rejoice with you by name and pray for you. If you have said this prayer and you're looking for a church home, you don't have one in your area, put your name and city and state in the chat and we will direct you to a church home in your area. We love you. We appreciate you and we, and we bless you. Right now, we ask you to do one more thing if you don't mind. Like and subscribe to our channel, to our page, and share this with someone else. We want them to know that Jesus lives. You know why? Because it's about time. Really is.